Hi everyone, this is Jeff Challen. So today in class, we're gonna have a special guest visiting us and I wanted to help keep us on track this week so that you guys continue the homework problems. And that means that I decided to record the screencast so that we can look at interfaces and specifically how interfaces are implemented in Java. A little bit of this is review from Monday, which so you're welcome to skip ahead. Uh, unfortunately, that lecture, the mic didn't seem to work, so I don't have any video to post of it. Um, so I'm gonna pick up kind of about 10 minutes where we left off at the end of lecture when I um, introduced interfaces as a concept. And then we're going to introduce the idea of working with interfaces in Java and what an interface means in the Java programming language. So the concept of an interface is something that we talk about in CS125 because it is so important and it really does pervade computer science and computer systems. We see interfaces all over the place. Um, an interface, as the name implies, is really a place in a computer system or a computer program where two things come together. It's the boundary between two things. Um, that boundary can be um, between many different parts of a computer system. So for example, you have interfaces between two pieces of software, uh, between the library that you're using and some other piece of code. Um, you can have interfaces between software and hardware. When you plug a new device into your computer, this thing that you sometimes have to install called a device driver is essentially the software that runs on your computer that understands how to talk to the hardware that you've connected. And it does that using an interface that's provided between your machine and this new widget that you've decided to hook up. You have interfaces between computers and their users. So these are sometimes known as computer, um, you know, computer, human computer interfaces. Um, things like a keyboard, that's an input device, that's an interface, it's a place where, you know, literally, in this case, you and your computer come into contact with each other, you're touching the computer. Um, a screen is also an example of an interface, again, a place where um, there's a boundary and data is being exchanged, so the pixels that are rendered by the computer are entering your eyeballs, so it's a boundary between you and the machine. And then we, again, you know, various permutations of these uh, different components between humans and hardware, between, you know, software and hardware and things like that. So their interfaces are, you know, something that, again, as a general concept, really does pervade the design of computer systems and computer applications in a way that's incredibly powerful. Um, and, you know, one of the things that's so important about interfaces is that because they are a place where two things come together and connect and touch and interact, that's a place where we need to be very specific and very careful about how we design communication between these two components. So if you think about software libraries, a well-designed software library has an interface that's easy for other people to use and makes them you know, eager and happy to integrate it into their own project. But in the best case, you know, when you use a software library, you guys are doing that on this MP checkpoint using the, the GSON library by Google, there's all sorts of code that Google wrote, somebody at Google wrote, that you don't need to understand. That code works to implement the interface that Google provides, but all you need to do is read the documentation so you understand when I call a particular method that's part of this package or part of this library, how does it work? What does it do for me? Uh, how does it interact with the rest of my program? So a well-defined interface um, you know, allows two different parts of a system to really define what they need to know about each other. What does my part of the system need to know about your part of the system? What does your part of the system need to know about my part of the system? And once we agree on that, and we agree about how the communication and the interaction across that interface is going to work, then a lot of what happens in each part of the system is completely hidden from the other parts. And that's a good thing, right? This is what allows big software development projects to work. So you have things like Microsoft Windows or Chrome or you know, all the code that powers Amazon's various uh, services. These are huge projects that are worked on by tens of thousands of people, and one of the main ways this happens is by coming to decisions about where different parts of the system touch and interact, the interfaces, and then how those interfaces are going to work. And then the teams can go out and work independently from each other, um, and things will still fit together and work once they're integrated in the end. So this is an incredibly uh, important idea. So let me give you just quickly some examples, again, to kind of set the stage. So there is 
um, there are all sorts of examples of software interfaces that separate two pieces of software. Sometimes those interfaces are really explicit, like when you use a library that has an API, an application programmer interface. That's an interface that's designed for you, the application programmer, to use. And those interfaces are usually well documented. There's a lot of you know, Javadoc that surrounds those interfaces so that you can figure out how to use it without doing too much work. But an interface can also be more implicit. So for example, the test cases that we write for each MP checkpoint or for the homework problems establish an interface between your code and our test suite. And again, that interface involves agreement. Um, if you decide to call your function something different, our test suite's not going to work because part of the interface between our test suite and your code is that you're going to write a function with a specific name that takes a specific set of arguments. If you violate that interface, then the test code won't be able to work. So that's an example of an interface that's uh, less implicit and sorry, less explicit and more implicit. Um, you know, again, there's lots of software hardware interfaces, and these are kind of fun, uh, fun places where thing, cool things happen, right? So, you know, when I teach class, and you know, there's a Chromecast that has been stuck in, and there's actually a bunch of different interfaces that are going on there. So, the interface between the Chromecast and the projector, there's an interface that's a that's a hardware to hardware interface. There's a there's software that runs on the Chromecast that helps manage that. And then the, when I plug in the Chromecast and connect to it over my laptop, now there's an interface that's established between my laptop and the Chromecast. Data is being sent actually over Wi-Fi, and there's software that runs on both my laptop and the Chromecast that makes that possible. So again, a lot of these sort of fun, you know, uh, new software gadgets and hardware gadgets that we all use are really examples of creating interesting interfaces between things that, that normally wouldn't have them. So normally I wouldn't be able to project my screen directly to the projector because my screen has one interface and the projector needs something that has a different interface, but the Chromecast allows those two things to be brought together. And then, you know, I mentioned there's a lots of different computer user interfaces. Pretty much every way that you interact with your computer, whether it's a touch screen, that little keyboard that pops up when using a phone, um, other peripherals, these are examples of computer user interfaces or human computer interfaces. And this is a really interesting, you know, area of study and, and increased development, right? I mean, thinking about how to make these interfaces better, um, thinking about what they'll look like in the future. Uh, we've had keyboards around for a long time and there's been a there's been a lot of points where people have said, oh, people are gonna stop using keyboards and everybody's gonna be talking to their computer or gesturing or the computer will just read your mind or whatever. And I think you know we will see some of those things in the future, even if uh, computer keyboards have turned out to be remarkably resilient as an input device. Okay, so now we're gonna focus in this class specifically on software interfaces. And of course, specifically on interfaces in the context of the Java programming language that we're using. Um, but, I just want to make it very clear that interfaces are not an idea that's tied to Java, or really not an idea that's tied to any specific language. You do have certain computer languages. Um, one example is Java, another example is Go, another example, there's a, there's a bunch of them, right? That actually include a specific notion of interfaces as part of the language specification. So in these computer languages, um, an interface means something specific. Um, so we'll see in Java exactly what an interface means. Interface is actually a keyword in the language, like class, like extends, right? It, it's something that means something very specific. Um, but even in languages that don't have a specific notion of an interface, like Python or JavaScript, interfaces still exist, right? Any place where two pieces of software come together and have to interact and communicate is an interface. It's an interface if you declare it like an interface in Java, or it's an interface if you don't and you're using a language that doesn't have that specific idea of what an interface is. Interfaces are something that every language has. Some languages choose to formalize that, others don't. But interfaces exist in every programming language that you will ever use. Okay. So one final note about, about this is that, you know, even we're gonna see in a few slides exactly what an interface means in Java. But even every Java class that you can possibly use, a class that's public and is visible to you as a programmer, has an interface. That interface, even if it doesn't implement a just specific Java interface. And the interface to a Java class is essentially the set of methods that it provides that you can use. So the set of public methods that a class provides. So, you know, let's see here. I'll look up Java blank string and 
pull up the documentation for that here. And let's get the latest documentation. Okay, so Java 10. Um, so again, I mean, Java Lang string does not implement an interface, but this right here is essentially the interface to a string. It consists of all these different uh, functions that we can call. Um, and again, I mentioned before that an interface is a place, well, I'm actually about to say that, right? So an interface is a place where we need really, really good documentation because part of the value behind an interface is that um, you can, it allows you to use something without understanding how it works. But that means that someone has to write down what it does and how to use it, right? So for example, let's look at the, tr the trim method right here. Returns a string whose value is this string with any leading and trailing white space removed. It tells me how to call it, doesn't take any arguments, and it tells me what it returns, which is a new string. So this is interface, <coughs> essentially interface documentation. It's in English or in another human language. Now again, I don't, there's no code here for trim. There's no code here for two lowercase. All there is is a description of what it does. This is what we need at the interface. Now there is code in the string class that implements two lowercase, but with a well-designed interface, I never have to read that code. I never have to know that it exists. I don't need to know how it works. All I need to do is read the documentation here. And if I need to convert a string to lowercase, I see that there's a method to help me do that. Okay. So this is what Javadoc is for basically. Javadoc is interface documentation. All right, so let's look at our first example of an interface in Java. So this is, like I said, uh, Java has an interface keyword. And if you look at this little snippet of code, the thing that it probably reminds you of is a class declaration. So we talked before about how classes allowed us to open up Java's type system and create new types, uh, new types of Java objects that have, that mix different types of state and behavior. And an interface on some level starts, you know, the beginning part of it looks sort of similar, right? So I've got public interface add, instead of class here, I've got interface. I have something that looks like a class name. We follow the same conventions for interface names that we do for class names, they're capitalized. Um, okay, and then I've got an open block. And, and now, okay, so what does this kind of look like, right? So this sort of looks like the beginnings of a method declaration. Right? I've got a return type, int. I've got a name of the method, add. I've got a list of parameters. I've got the first parameter is an int. It's named first. The second parameter is an int. It's named second. But then, nothing. I've got a colon. Sorry, a, a semicolon. Right? There's no body of, of this method. Right? So in many ways, Java interfaces look like objects without any contents, just method signatures with no implementation. So interface, this interface, you know, what does it tell me? So it's got a name called add, and then it's saying essentially that a function exists called add. And I can learn things about that function from looking at, you know, the interface declaration. So I know that there's a function called add that takes two arguments, first and second, and returns an int. That's all I know. There's no code here. So clearly the interface doesn't by itself do anything. Um, because there's no code here to implement add, but it is sort of providing some information about, you know, something, right? Um, now, interfaces can declare both methods and variables. We're going to focus on uh, methods in this class. Interface variables are essentially uh, only useful for declaring constants. Any variable that you uh, associate with an interface has to essentially be public static final. Um, and so they don't hold, you know, it's not, I don't think it's useful to think about interfaces declaring variables in a way that's at all analogous to how an object class declares variables. Um, they're really just useful for declaring constants. All right, so, so clearly by itself, this interface is providing information, but, you know, clearly not doing anything. There's no code here to run. It's just a declaration of a function. So in order for, um, the reason that we declare interfaces is because classes can then implement them. So once I have a declared interface, I can declare that another class implements that interface. So here's my add interface on line one, declares a function called add, and it says, you know, this function takes two arguments and returns an int. Now I have a class called adder. So this is now looking more familiar to us, the first part of this, public class adder, so I'm declaring a new type. Um, and I say it implements add. 
So again, this is a little similar to extends, right? We saw extends before, that meant that I was extending another class, that I was going to inherit its state of behavior and potentially add some of my own things. When you implement an interface in Java, um, what you commit to doing is you, you use this implements keyword, and then you have to implement all of the methods that the interface declares. So this interface declares one method. Um, it declares a method called add that takes two arguments. In order to implement add, my adder class has to actually provide an implementation for add. So that kind of makes sense. The implements keyword makes sense. So essentially what I'm saying is I'm going to take this interface and actually make it work. Right? So you told me there was a function called add that take two arguments. I'm actually going to define how add works. I'm going to implement add. And so my class is providing uh, an implementation of that function in public and add takes two arguments and then returns the two of them sum together, which is what we would expect add to do. Right? All right, so again, interfaces don't declare, they don't do anything useful by themselves. They essentially kind of um, provide the declaration of what a certain capability is, right? So a class can add things, right? Um, and then to declare that you implement an interface uses implements key. All right, so let's play with this a little bit. So let's look at this code again. This is just you know pretty much what we've been looking at loaded into the playground. So uh, I've got a public interface add. Um, it's declaring one method called add that takes two arguments. And then I have this public class called adder. Okay, now here, um, what I'm doing is, actually, let's do this. Um, let's just have this be an adder reference for now. So let's say adder add is equal to new adder. So I'm creating a new adder. And then I'm going to try calling this um, add function. Now, if I run this, you know, clearly right now, I haven't implemented add. And so this is not going to compile. So now let's declare that my adder class is going to implement the add interface. Um, now, if I run this, I need I get a different error um, because now I've told the compiler, "Hey, I plan on implementing the add interface. You know, I see what I need to do to implement this, and I plan on doing it." And now the compiler is telling me, "Hey, you told me you were going to implement the add interface, but I don't see an add function anywhere." All right, so let's implement that. Let's say int add int first and second, um, and let's just let's just do what we did before. Turn first plus second. Uh, okay, so I need, to, I need to declare this as public. There we go. All right, great. So now I can call this function, right, which is great. Um, now, let me just point out a couple of things here. So first of all, I don't have to implement add in order to get this to work, right? This will work fine, right? Um, I implement add uh, as a way of declaring that I'm going to provide this particular capability, and it's also because we're, um, we're, we're doing this example on interfaces. Um, let, let's see what happens if I change the interface. So let's say I add another method. Uh, now what's going to happen? So now I get the same error I got before, which is to say that the compiler is complaining that I haven't fully implemented the add interface. And, and interfaces can have multiple methods. In fact, a lot of times they do. Right? So not always, uh, but a lot of times. And so here's a case where I have two add methods. And now if I want to fully implement the add interface, I'm going to have to implement both of them. OK, great. Now, notice here, you know, I don't have to uh, follow. I don't have to use the same parameter names as the interface uses. That's up to me. Um, you know, the, what the interface does is set up type signatures uh, for the methods that, um, that I need to declare. So essentially, this says you need to uh, implement a method called add that takes three integer arguments. What I call them is up to me. OK. Well, let's go ahead for a minute, and then we'll come back and, and, and look at this example again when we talk about uh, interface references. So here, so now when I have an object, when I have a class that implements an interface, so we talked before about when I, you know, and, and because we've been being more specific about the difference between a, the reference variable type and the object type, we talked about the fact that a reference variable can store a reference to an object of that type 
or any of its descendants, so any object that extends the type of the reference variable. Reference variables can also store a reference to a class that implements an interface. So the reference variable type can be an interface type. And then what the compiler will do is check to make sure that the class that I'm holding a reference to or that I'm trying to set the reference to implements that interface. So that's what's going on here on line 12, okay? So now what I'm doing over here on the left is I'm saying I'm creating a reference variable called lowercase add, and that reference is gonna store a reference to something that implements the add interface, okay? So that's what I'm telling the compiler. And then on the right side, I'm creating an object called adder, and that's what I'm gonna to use to try to initialize the value of this reference variable. And because adder implements add, that works out fine. Um, however, once I have a interface reference, so remember what we talked about before, if I, I can take any Java object and upcast it to a capital O object reference, but then I can't call any methods that are defined on that object. I can only call methods that are defined on capital O object, like toString and you know things like that. And the same thing is true for interface. So let's look at this example. Adder implements add. The add interface says in order to implement, you have to implement a function called add. It doesn't say anything about multiply. And so once I refer to the object as something that implements add, I can no longer call multiply, even though the object that I use to initialize the reference does implement multiply. All right, so let's let's make this more concrete, go back to the playground here. Okay. So let's do let's do this. Okay, so now. Let's do a couple examples of this. So first, let's look at a case where I have something that um, implements. So, so here's what I'm doing here. On line 11, I have the class called adder. I'm not implementing any interfaces. I'm just providing a public method called add that takes two parameters and returns their sum. I'm not implementing add. I can create, so here what I'm doing is on the right side, I'm creating a, an instance of the class adder, and I'm saving it in a reference variable that can store an instance of add. And because of that, I can call add.add, .add because add is a, is a reference variable that stores a reference to adder, and adder uh, implements the add function, okay? Now, let's do this, okay? So that still works. Um, actually, sorry, let's do, uh, let's not do this yet. Let's just do this. Okay, so now let's try changing my add variable to be an interface reference. So this now says, I want to use add to refer to something that implements the add interface. And what you're going to see is that I get a compiler error when I try to compile this code because adder cannot be converted to add. Why? Because adder doesn't implement the add interface. Once I uh, add implements add, this works fine. Now let's let's write a second class and let's implement add as well. Provide in this case. Well, you know what? Here's the here's another uh, lesson about interfaces. I don't have any way to determine whether or not the class implemented the interface quote unquote correctly. All the interface knows is that you're providing a function called add that takes two integer arguments and returns an integer. It doesn't know if you're actually adding them together. This is where good documentation comes in hand, right? So now the interface says you should add the two arguments. My another class isn't doing that, but for the sake of, of messing around, let's just keep this up for now. Okay, so here's what I can do. Now I can say add is equal to new another. Um, and now, I, so, so again, slow down and just go through this carefully. So here on line 17, I'm saying I'm declaring a variable called lowercase add that's gonna store a reference to any object that implements the add interface. I initialize it to store a reference to an adder object. But then on line 18, I change that reference to store a reference to this another object. And I can do that because another implements add. So this variable can store reference to anything that implements the add interface. If other didn't implement add, then I would get a compiler error here on line 18. This line's fine because add or implements add. This line is not okay because another does not implement add. But let's have another implement add. Now, 
here, let's do public void something else. Just, you know, let's just have this be an empty function. Hopefully, check style is not going to be too angry. And then let's do public, public void whatever. And I've got another sort of empty function. So I can't call, it's important to note here, I cannot call whatever here. All right? Because whatever is not part of the add interface. The add interface only includes this method called add. Whatever is par only part of the another class. Uh, same thing here, I couldn't call something else. Um, let's try that. Something else. I can't do that either because I can only have, if I have a reference to something that implements an interface, I can only call methods that are implemented on the interface. So I could do this. Let's do void something else, um, right? Now I have another problem, which is another needs to implement something else, right? And now I could call add.something else because it's actually part of the interface. And let's, in this case, let's just, just so I can prove that it's doing something, um, let's have it do. Pieces are confusing. There we go. Okay. Good. So again, you know, if I have something that implements an interface, I can refer to it using a reference of the interface type. That's essentially the, the takeaway here. Um, okay. So I just did this. So this is in some ways. So I, I want to make a point here about is this relationship to inheritance, right? So in some ways, this is pretty similar to inheritance and, and overloading, right? The interface is sort of like a parent class. Um, implements is sort of like extends and providing your own implementation is sort of like overriding a parent's method. So this is kind of like extending a super class, extending another class, and then implementing, overriding a method that was provided by that class. Um, and it turns out, um, so again, here, here, here's, the, here's the, the example of this, right? So. I can, you know, I'm doing something similar here, except that now add is a, is a public class and it implements add. Um, I'm upcasting my reference to an adder object to add because I can do that because it extends add. And then here, if I want, I can just override the method. And, and have it do whatever I want, right? Okay, so now, so now I have, you know, behavior that in some ways looks very similar to the, the example I just walked through. And actually, if we go back and we pull one of our buzzword, uh, you know, keyword bingo uh, cards out again, uh, abstract classes make it possible for this to be even more similar because I can also have abstract methods, okay? So, and again, I don't want to dwell here because I do want to talk about interfaces, but I just kind of want to make the, I'm, I'm trying to, what I'm trying to draw out here is what's special about interfaces. And so to see that, what we first have to think about is what could we do using the class inheritance model that we already know about. So here's an example. I have a public abstract class called add and it implements an abstract method. If I declare an abstract method, I can't provide an implementation of it. So if I try to do this, um, I'm struggling today, all right? Um, you're gonna see that it's complaining abstract methods cannot have a body. So this cannot have a body. It can only, um, and now you'll see when I extend add, the compiler actually will fail because it says I have to implement add. So now I actually have to uh, provide an implementation for add since it's abstract. I'll do Great. So, so now you'll see Okay, so here was my example using extension, where my parent class actually provided a default implementation and I overwrote it. And now if I use abstract, I can actually have a case where my parent doesn't provide the uh, default implementation. Because back here, the problem could be, you know, there's actually no requirement that I even provide add. I could just not override it and then I get this, you know, nonsensical result. Right here, I can't do that. I have to implement add. If I take this out, um, you know, we're going to see that same compiler error. 
because add is an abstract method, meaning that when I extend the class, I have to provide an implementation. I can't get away. Okay, so, so why do we need interfaces? It seems like we could have actually gotten very similar behavior to um, what we had, you know, to what we wanted, what we talked about before, just using a combination of extension inheritance and abstract classes and methods. So why interfaces? Okay, so here's the problem with Java's inheritance model. It's limited. Every class can only have one parent. And, there's, and that means that essentially, you know, if you think about how children inherit capabilities, that means that if I want a certain, if I want, in an, in, you know, certain classes to be able to do certain things, then an entire part of the tree has to be able to do that. So as soon as, as, soon as I add a capability to character, then digit, letter, vowel, and consonant all have to be able to do that thing. Right? And sometimes I don't want that. Sometimes I want to you know, have things that are a little bit more flexible. So one of the, the big differences between, inherit, between inheritance and interfaces in Java is that classes can implement multiple interfaces. Um, and this is super important. So here's an example. Now I've got two interfaces. I have an add interface and a subtract interface. And then I have this mathy class. And the mathy class declares that it implements two interfaces. And I can declare that I implement as many interfaces as I want. When I declare that I implement multiple interfaces, I have to implement all of the methods that are declared in all the interfaces that I declare that I implement. So to implement add, I have to, to you know, implement this uh, add method that takes two integer arguments and returns an integer. To implement subtract, I have to implement a method called subtract that takes two integers. And so this is the big difference between inheritance and um, interfaces in Java, is that a class can implement multiple interfaces. Uh, it cannot extend multiple classes. And so again, here's an example of this. Um, and then you know, if, I, if I wanted to add a method here, let's do another subtract method. Um, Now I'm going to get a, a failure because I have to implement that one too, and I'll just do this quickly using the assistant code. I'm not sure what the. I guess what I'll do is I'll just have b first minus second minus third. Now I implement everything. Okay. So so that's interfaces in Java. So now let's let's uh, step up a minute, and and we're going to spend a lot of time between today's screencast and Friday talking about what interfaces are and how they work because this is something that's new. Uh, a new concept, I think, pretty much for everybody who took this class, no matter what, how much uh, prior experience you had, uh, because interfaces aren't something I don't think that gets covered um, in, in most AP courses, uh, and if so, not particularly well. Uh, but this is what's really, really important about interfaces, is that, you know, regardless of how they're, interfa uh, about how they're implemented, and regardless about whether actually they're part of the language, like they are in Java or not, like they are in JavaScript, an interface represents a contract between two parts of your program or two parts of the system. And the idea is that the interface you know, uh, codifies the things that two parts need to know in order for things to work correctly. Okay? Now, this interface that I'm showing you is one that we're going to use a lot over the next uh, few days in the homework problems and on the quiz next week and in other places. Okay, and this is actually a real Java interface. Um, let's see here, uh, Java variable interface. Um, I can pull up the Java doc for it. Uh, there's a lot of obviously other stuff like that. Okay, so here's so this is actually a real interface. Uh, it's an interface as you can see that's implemented by a lot of classes, um, and this is you know the definition, right? I'm, I'm showing you a simplified version of this, but this is pretty much it. Okay, so okay. what does it mean for something to be? So this is an interface called comparable, and it has one method called compare to. That method returns an int. It takes an object reference to another object, and it returns an int. Okay, and here's one place. You know, if if you were just the add interface we looked at, it was sort of sort of clear what was supposed to happen if I have a function called add and it takes two integer arguments. Uh, even if I didn't give VM any, any Java doc, you could probably guess what that was supposed to do. Here, it's less clear. What, you know, if all I gave you was this, right, uh, you wouldn't be sure what to do. But here's what this interface is supposed to do. 
comparable is an interface that a class can implement if it instances of that class can be put in order. Okay? And that means that there's a meaningful order that exists among objects in that class. And we'll talk, we'll talk more about this as we continue to go deeper with comparable. Because this is kind of an interesting concept. The compare to, now if, if you are comparable, if your class can be compared, if there's a meaningful uh, order among instances of your class, then to show Java, to show other parts of Java how to compare to instances of your class, you only have to implement one function. That function is called compare to. Compare to takes a reference to another object and it returns uh, the following a negative integer, zero, or a positive integer, as this object is less than, equal to, or greater than the specified object. So if other is less than this object, <coughs> you return something negative. It could be negative one, it could be something else. If it's equal, you return zero. If it's greater than, if this object is greater than the specified object, you return a positive number, okay? Let's actually go through here uh, because sometimes I get this wrong, right? Um, returns a negative, negative number, zero positive, as this object is less than, equal to, or greater than the specified object, okay? Compares this object with the specified object for order. So why is this a good example of an interface? Um, the reason is that not every Java object can be compared in a meaningful way to other Java, to other instances of that class. Some can, some can't. And the ones that can and the ones that can't, like you might have objects that inherit from an object that is comparable that aren't comparable. And you might have objects that extend an object that isn't comparable that want to establish a comparison relationship. So this is a, you can think of it as a trait. It's like a, a capability that some classes in Java have and others don't. If your class has this capability, you can declare that you implement comparable and then you have to implement this one function to show someone using your class, how to compare two instances of that object, okay? What does that get you? Okay, so this is, this is where this becomes really cool, right? So again, interfaces are awesome, and this is where this becomes really powerful. So if you implement comparable, let's say you create a new class in Java, okay? And it's, it's part of a project you're working on, and you realize, okay, well actually I can, I can uh, put, you know, I can actually sort, there's an order here. I, there's a meaningful order among instances of my class, right? So for example, if you're working on the machine project and you wanted to order games, maybe a meaningful order is um, by time. Like when did the game start, right? So I order games so that uh, games that started earlier in time always come before games that started later in time. So if you give me two games, what I do is I look at their timestamps, like when did they start, and I tell you that the one that started earlier is less than the one that started great later. Okay, so that's an example. All you have to do is do that. And then there's all this other code in Java that can do the following. So all of a sudden, I can take an array of objects of your class and I can sort them. I don't, know any, I don't need to know anything more about your class other than how to put two instances in order. That's it. Once I know that, I can sort the array. I can also find the maximum or minimum value. We're about to do that as an example, right? Um, I can arrange instances of your class into a data structure called a binary tree that we're going to come back and talk about in a couple of weeks. So this one, again, this is a, 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 you know, why interfaces are so powerful. By doing this one thing, so essentially you, you are setting up a new interface between your class and other parts of Java, and there's all sorts of other parts of Java that can use this interface that you are now implementing to do useful things. You don't have to write that code. You don't have to know how it works. And that code doesn't have to know anything more about your class. The only thing it has to know about your class is how to compare two instances of that class. So again, just to make this really crystal clear, because this comparable instance represents this abstraction barrier, when you implement comparable, you don't have to worry about how a sorting function is going to use that implementation to put instances of your class in order. You don't have to worry about how the binary tree code works. All you have to do is tell Java, tell the world how to compare two instances of your class. Similarly, when I use comparable, so every interface has two sides. There's the implementer and the user. 
When I use comparable, I don't need to worry about how the interface is this implemented but I know that I can correctly compare two objects of, as long as they implement comparable, okay? This is tough. I understand this is a slippery idea. We'll come back and we'll talk about it more on Friday uh, and we'll try to wedge this as firmly into your brain as possible, right? Um, this is an example of something in computer science that's known as an abstraction barrier. So there is a, a point of agreement here. What we've agreed is that when you implement comparable, you implement this function and we've agreed about how the function works. And that's all we need to agree on. At that point, your code just has to implement comparable, and all the other code out there that uses this ability to compare to instances of your class just goes on its way doing what it was doing, and there's no other communication or coordination that's required between those code bases, which is a great thing. <coughs> okay, so we're going to close out today with an example of this for fun. Okay, so. It turns out, so the first thing let's do is it turns out that um, there's a lot of code out there in Java that already implements comparable. Let me give you an example. So I'm going to create, um, for every Java primitive type, there's something called a wrapper type. The wrapper type is the object that stores a value of that primitive type. So for int, the wrapper type is called capital I integer. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to create a array of um, integers okay and then I'm going to call this um, oh, it's, it's angry with me okay I can upcast this. Java.lang that integer not implement comparable. Let's try this. Oh, I know why. It's because I'm using this. Let's get rid of this and see what happens now. Um, yeah, okay. I think this is going to work. I'm using this. Oh, it's okay. Check style. Let's relax here. Boom. Okay, great. So sorry. Let me do this. Let's go back to integer. And then this back to integer. This will should this should still work. Okay. Um, let me put that definition back, but I'm going to put it under a comment because the problem is if we put this in here, then we're using our comparable interface and what I want to do is use Java's comparable interface. Okay. All right, great. So, I'm close comment. Cool. All right, so now, so now let's look at an example of using an interface. So, this function called maximum, all right, and, and we'll come back, we're going to talk about this more on Friday, but this function takes an array of values that can be compared. So this is an example of casting something to an interface type. So I know that the values that are stored in this array are all values where I can compare them to each other. All right. Um, and that's critical for my maximum function to work. Okay. So my maximum function is going to turn an object. It's going to turn the maximum of this array. And all I need to know in order to finish this, in order to do this, is that all these values are comparable. So let's implement maximum. We can actually do this. Okay, so let's say uh, first we need to do if values is equal to null or values.length is equal to zero, we'll just return null in that case. Else if values.length is equal to one, we'll just return values zero. So these are kind of the corner cases. If the values array is null or it doesn't have any uh, content and doesn't actually contain anything, we'll just return null. If it only contains one value, then the maximum is the first value. Okay. Otherwise, here's what I'm going to do. And, and you guys have implemented this before. Um, I'm going to say that I'm going to start off saying that the maximum is the first value. And then I'm going to go through the rest of the array just using a for loop. Yeah, you guys have been missing for loops. They're coming back. 
and I'm gonna say, now what I need to do is check if the current value is greater than the maximum. And how do I do that? Well, let's go back and look in comparable. So that I know that I can call this compare to function. So because what I have is a comparable, um, because my values rate is full of comparables, I can say if values i dot compare to maximum, um, and it says it's going to return positive integer. This number is greater than the specified object. So if values compare to is greater than zero, I'm going to say maximum is equal to values i. So I'm going to save a reference to the maximum value, and then down here I'm going to return maximum. Okay. Check that out. How cool is that? So um, now I'm doing this with integers, okay? Um, and again, I can now um, find the maximum of anything that implements comparable. So how this, this is actually really neat. Let's try some string. So I can say new string, strings implement comparable. Uh, new string interfaces, new string are Okay, so now let's get rid of my integer one. I'm going to do strings. Oh, what's mad at me about the. Let's see here. Check style. How do you want me to do this? Let's try that. Um, it should be eight. wants that to be eight. There we go. Okay, so now I can print the maximum of an array of strings. Um, I can compute the maximum of anything that implements comparable, right? Um, again, this is like so powerful because this piece of code that I've now written works for any Java object that implements comparable, any object at all. Now, let's do the other part. Let's actually implement comparable for an instance of our class, right? For an instance of the value class, okay? So actually, I don't want to get rid of you yet. Um, so first of all, let's try to see what happens if I do this. So let's say I have a public class called value, and I'm going to say basically do initial value. I'll just have to store an int. All right, so now my compiler is complaining because it says value cannot be converted to a comparable. And the reason is value does not implement comparable. So I've created this new class, but I haven't shown Java how to compare two instances of it. So now let's implement my comparable interface. Um, and it's gonna tell me that I need to implement this method. So int compare to um, object other. And for now, let's just return zero. Okay. Um, oh, I've got to make a call. And oh, what's mad about this? Okay. So essentially, at this point, it's basically saying that oh, and let's add a two string method here. So this uh, looks a little nicer. Public string two string. Turn that. In. Oh. So now what I'm doing is I'm basically saying the, the values are always equal. And so the maximum value for my array is going to be whatever is the first value, because nothing will ever be bigger than that. All right? That's probably not what I want. So I need to do a little bit more work here. So the first thing, and this is kind of like equals, the first thing is I have a reference to an object. And I actually don't, that's actually not what I want. What I need is a reference to a value so that I can check its value. So just like equals, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say that um, if O, if I'm going to return zero. So now what I'm saying is if the thing that you pass me does not actually return to a, refer to a value, then I'm just going to say that it's the same. Right? There's actually a better way to handle this, but this is the best thing that we can do right now. Otherwise, I'm going to create a value reference, 
and I'm going to downcast my object reference to that value reference. And I know that I can do that because I've done this check here. So if O is not instant, an instance of a value, then I've already returned. And so now I can do what I can do is I can create another reference, an other reference to something. Um, I can downcast this object reference safely. And now let's say, um, let's do return other.value minus value. So how is this going to work? So if other.value is bigger than my value, then this is going to return a positive number. If it's smaller, it's going to return a negative number. And if it's the same, it's going to return zero. And that's pretty much uh, what corresponds to the, um, you know, to the, to the, to the, to the interface here, except I think I have it backwards. So let's try, let's try something like this. Let's see what we get here. Okay. So yeah, I think I have this backwards. So this is always gets me with this interface. So a uh, positive integer if this object is greater than the specified object. So right now, if the value, if the other value is bigger, I return a positive object. And so I'm actually, I'm, I'm actually flipped it around, right? So rather than sorting smallest, rather than saying that the smaller value is less than the greater value, I'm saying the greater value is less than the smaller value. And that's kind of fun, actually. That's sort of um, what, what I wanted uh, to try here to show you, right? Uh, because now that we have our own class, we're in charge of deciding how we want to compare it to other classes. So here's an example where now I'm, I'm returning um, the, I'm saying that another a value is greater than another value if its value is bigger. Um, but if I swap these around, if I invert this comparison, now I've got the opposite. Now I'm returning the smallest value. So again, you know, the, the, the cool thing about this you know, and, and so here I have uh, both a consumer of an interface and I have the provider of an interface, right? So this class provides, implements the comparable interface. This piece of code is using the comparable interface to compare different values. And because a bunch of other uh, classes out there implement comparable, I can actually, you know, like I, I just did before, I can actually now find the maximum value of all sorts of different types of, you know, uh, of, of arrays of all sorts of different types of objects. Right? The only thing that they need to do is implement the comparable interface. Okay, so this should be enough to get you through the next couple of homework problems. We will come back and continue this conversation on Friday. Um, I know that this is this is kind of this is really the last thing we're going to talk about in objects. Next week on uh, Friday on Monday we're going to move on to the third part of the class and begin talking about data structures and algorithms. This is it for objects. This is um, you know the the most difficult I think conceptual bit of the object oriented part of the class, but it's also incredibly useful. You know, if you can wrap your mind around this concept, around what it means for something to implement an interface and the difference between an interface provider and an interface user, um, you will be well prepared to understand how many, many different types of computer systems work. All right, I'll see you uh, guys in class today and then in class on Friday. Good luck on the homework problem.